Welcome, welcome your backup plan tribe to another wonderful show today. We have Heidi Dunstan from Calgary, Alberta coming to us today with a shoulder to lean on, a guide to understanding and supporting grief. You know, we never talk about this enough. I'm so excited to have Heidi come on today and tell her exceptional, amazing story that I'm sure I'm going to tear up about. Um, but she has some great tips and tricks for us today that I don't want you to, you know, not get because they're amazing, amazing tips and tricks for us today. So if you are new here, welcome. You've reached Tina. I am um, a podcaster, as you know, and I have your backup plan app that I created and developed. I'm a best-selling author of In the Blink of an Eye. Remember, Jeannie? That's how fast something happens. Just like that. Something occurs that you didn't expect and you're never prepared. Like Mike Tyson says, you think you have a plan until you get punched in the face. And then you realize that your plan wasn't really very good. <laughs> so we talk about real life stories on our show with really amazing people like Heidi that we have coming on our show today. And their life changing events in their lives. Yes, trauma, sickness or death. We don't talk about it enough and we don't talk about that in the blink of an eye. Yep, that something can happen that quickly. There's no five minute evacuation notice, you know, that we're not given. Wildfires were very lucky to have a five minute evacuation notice, but in a lot of cases, we're not given that. You know, let's use the example of the earthquake in Turkey and Syria this last week. Did they get a five minute evacuation notice? Well, they probably did, but no one was aware of what the signs were. Nobody saw, heard the dog howling that I've seen on so many different videos. Nobody saw the light flashes that were happening from energy that was created. And, you know, it was four in the morning. So nobody expected that. And there's so many lives lost, so much information that we'll never know, so much stuff that is messy and you don't have a grab bag for, or a hurricane that you don't have prepared. You know, when we live in these wildfire locations, do we have some sort of plan set up with insurance, with, with um, you know, sprinkler systems or anything like that. That's part of a plan. And your backup plan is a plan for you and your loved ones to be able to know where your stuff is when the time comes. And I'm sure Heidi's going to give us some pointers around that as well. Um, we created the app so it would organize all of your details, your medical, any emergency, sudden death stuff, unexpected tragedies, to avoid all that tremendous stress for you and your loved ones after. And it's at your fingertips. It helps you guide you and assist you in your life puzzle pieces so you know what to do, how to do it, and why you should do it. So let's get the party started. I'm so very excited. If you are new here, welcome. Please like, share, and subscribe to our show. I'm so happy to have you come on each and every week with us and don't forget to press on that bell down below and the subscribe button and please share it with others. Grief is a very special thing and if you just did one thing for one person that's grieving, that is to share some tips and tricks of grieving with those others because it's very special and maybe something will resonate and help them out. So let's get the party started and we'll bring on our little short commercial and we'll get the party started. I'm moving to the music. 
Bert. I'm so thrilled to have you back with us today. And I've had no luck with this transition this year, this past year <laughs> since January 1st. So I'm so excited that that worked today. So thank you for coming on our show. I'm so excited to have Heidi. Let's bring her on. Let's bring her in. There she is. Hi, Heidi. Hi, Tina. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here with you today. I'm excited to have you. And you're not in Calgary today, but that's okay. You're in somewhere hot and beautiful. I am. I'm <laughs> grateful to be here. I wish I was with you. Um, well, you know, Heidi, we have so much to say on this topic. Um, I can't believe how I'm an emergency preparedness coach and you're a grief educator and advocate that we can never say enough about grief. And I'm excited to have you on our show today. So thank you. Where did all of this start for you, Heidi? Well, unfortunately, I lost my husband unexpectedly in 2018. It was two days after Christmas and the day before my 40th birthday, and he died unexpectedly of a heart attack. And I'm grateful we have a huge support network. We met in a personal development seminar, so we had lots of people around us. But you know, I had a lot of support around me, but I also had people that just said things that missed the mark and that just didn't really feel like it was able to, they were able to support me at a time when I really needed to be supported. And as I spent time with more and more grievers, I learned that my story wasn't unusual, that all of us have these stories of things that people said that shouldn't have been said. And but not only that, Heidi, do you think that you even knew what you wanted to have said to you, you know? Yeah. I don't think we know either until somebody says something really nice and then it makes you feel good. Yeah, you know, and, and it's – our grief education is is very limited. I mean, you and I were chatting backstage and we talk about the fact that, you know, we read an obituary, we send a card and flowers or maybe make a donation in somebody's name. We attend a service, we maybe make a lasagna or a casserole. And that's about as much as we know how to do. Um, and grief goes a lot further than just that funeral or that uh, celebration of life. It's, I believe grief is love and that somebody will grieve and love their person till the last breath they take. And so we have to have tools and things to do and say that can be supportive, whether it be in the moment, like a week, month, or you know, a couple months after somebody's died, or even years down the road, because grief comes in waves, and we don't get to choose when they come, and they come for different reasons. And um, we've we've got to kind of build our I call it your grief muscle, and learn how to support people in those moments, because we live in a world that wants to fix people, and we don't like people in pain. And when we can look at grief and say they're not in pain, they're they're hurting, but they're loving their person, they're missing their person, they're remembering a legacy. Um, and that can look very different for every person. Yeah. And if we can hold that space and have ways to be able to just be with that person in that moment, not fix them, not minimize them, it can look really different and it can change our relationships to for the better. I think a lot of times people don't want to share in that pain. So they, it, they get scared and they don't know how to deal with it. Yeah, I think, I think as a griever, we armor up. Once we get shot down and we get hurt, the armor starts to go up. And every time we go outside and we think, oh, i got to deal with this, I'm, I'm not going to be open. And that's really detrimental because I believe that isolation is not, like lo grief is, love is about connection. Grief is about connection. And when all of a sudden you're isolating it, you're, you're breaking that down and it makes it really hard. But from the supporter side, it can make it really messy when we don't know what to say and we don't know what to do and we all of a sudden start pulling away. And that's why I call my program Lean Into Grief because when it, I believe that those moments when you feel like you want to pull away, those are the moments when you're meant to lean in and support somebody. I don't know if they really know how to support though. It's kind of like when I talk to people about being prepared for the unexpected. Um, people think they have a plan or they, they think they're organized, but thinking isn't actually the result when it happens. Um, like Mike Tyson says, when you get punched in the face, all of a sudden, like, 
I've been talking now, I've been walking with Tina on Friday afternoons, talking about Lisa Marie Presley's estate and the mess it is. Even though they have so much money and such a celebrity, it doesn't matter who you are. You're all in the same boat with with a tragedy, with pain and grief. It doesn't change. No, it doesn't. And, and sadly, grief, especially in those early days, weeks, months, even that first year when you're dealing with the estate on top of the emotional stuff, and, and people forget that grief isn't just emotional, it's physical, right? So, I mean, I felt like I was having a heart attack for almost a year. Like my chest pain was it's significant. My brain fog was was intense. You know, I'd, I'd get down to the front door heading out for a meeting and I wasn't wearing pants. Or I'd find my car keys in the dishwasher or my mail in the freezer. And so when people are like, Heidi, you forgot this meeting, it wasn't that I was intentionally forgetting, it's that my brain was offline. And and so people forget. Not that sure it where it goes, <laughs> but I say it does disappear. It does. You know what, the way I, I kind of um, equate it to is like a computer and, and all of a sudden it's like a massive program has been added to your, your computer and it's slowing it down. Yeah. And or also, isolating it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kind of like when we do the defrags, right? Like, yeah. um, and, and all of a sudden you've, you know, I know that I, I could sit down to work on something and three hours would pass by and I'd get nothing done. And I'd have no idea where those three hours went. And I was fully awake. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't, but it was just that time just disappeared. Time in the early days and weeks and months of grief is a vortex. It doesn't make sense. The nights go by so slowly and the days yeah. can go by so fast. And, and people don't get that. And so, I'd be scared of the nights. I'd end up being scared to go to sleep. Yeah. I don't know why. It didn't make any sense, really. Well, for but me, then, it was, yeah. But then you thought, well, yeah, if I go to bed at 11 o'clock, it just makes the night even longer in pain. So what if I go to bed at 3 or 4 in the morning and then it's not so painful? Yeah. Yeah. Because lots of times... The nighttime is when we get, that's when our head turns on and we start thinking. And, you know, and when it's a spouse or somebody that you're intimate with, all of a sudden it, it changes everything. And so it can be really messy. And so sleep gets, I mean, I used to, I, I wouldn't sleep at night and I'd get up and I'd have to have a morning nap. I felt like a toddler because, yeah. you know, at 10 o'clock I was like, I'm exhausted. But, and, and I'd sleep in these like two hour increments because my body wouldn't allow me to do anything more. It's yeah. hard. It, it, it's so much more than an emotional process. Yes. And then when you add things like the estate, um, shutting down accounts, dealing with the government, all of that stuff, that's even after the funeral or the, the celebration of life. It's messy and it's hard and it's daunting. And then when you deal with somebody that comes up to you and goes, oh, I understand grief. I went through divorce. And you just, you're like, what? Like, how is that even the same? <laughs> right? Like, you can still see your person. You can still hear their voice. You can still talk to them. Like, you can run into them at the mall, even if you don't want to. I want to hear my husband's voice. I want to see him. I can't. Yeah. Right? And I get when the person said it to me, they meant it in a way to try to say, hey, I understand grief. Yeah. Um, as a, a form of connection. But in that moment, even the person standing beside me said that was inappropriate because it hurt. It was like those situations aren't the same. Yeah. But what we try to do is we try to compare. And when we do, we often end up missing the mark and end up hurting the person that we want to actually support. And, and that's what often happens is people say these things that miss the mark and they don't know how to back out of it and they feel uncomfortable. It's a really awkward transition, right? Like somebody looks at me a month after he passed and says, how are you? And I'm like, this sucks and I hate it. But they wanted me to say I was good, fine or okay. Well, I yeah. wasn't any of it. No, right? and I think um, as soon as they say, how are you? It triggers this, this heaviness that goes right into your heart. Yeah. And, and just by changing a few words, I think instead, 
because that just makes you feel like it. I try and tell people it feels like, you know, have you ever been hurt either like when you maybe were a kid and you fell and hit yourself and you're scarred or you have blood coming down from your legs or whatever. And you're coming home from school and as soon as close as you get to the house door, (laughs) it just becomes worse and worse and worse. And like your tears just well up. And then as soon as you see your mom, it just like makes everything like super bad. Yeah. That's the kind of feeling that you get when somebody says, how are you? And who would ever think that wasn't okay? Well, and and I think, I think it's because people don't realize that grief takes everything else away. And so it leaves you living in the moment. And so instead of saying, how are you to somebody who's grieving, especially in early grief, like the first six, eight, 12 months, I encourage people to say, how's today? Where are you at today? And that little change can make such a big difference because with how are you, we, we do accept people who are okay. They don't, they don't want to hear our crappy story that we're hurting. We don't live in a world that likes pain. And so they don't want to hear about it. But if you can say, how's today? It's like, hey, you know what? I haven't slept. I haven't eaten. You know, the first three months after I lost my husband, I lost 30 pounds. Now, Tina, I got some weight to lose, so it wasn't a bad thing. But everybody was like, oh, my gosh, you look fabulous. You've lost so much weight. I had one friend who said, have you lost all this weight because you're not eating? And I was like, I hate eating myself. Yeah. Mike's gone. It is, it is different eating by yourself. It is. And so I was, I, I could, I could only stomach, I would eat one meal a day. And the grace and courage it took for that friend to say, are you not eating? I'd like to bring meals over and, and, and enjoy meals with you. Or I'd like you to come to our house and have dinner with us. At least once a week or something. Yeah, like just, I mean, yeah, I didn't need a babysitter, but just, you know, That's got to be hard to be by yourself when you always had your person. Yeah. Right. I mean, and and I had zero ability to multitask. So I couldn't cook more than two things on the stove at the same time because I burnt one, if not both of them. And so even that, like even when I made an attempt, it just highlighted to me how different I was. And it kind of just kickstarted that whole grief cycle over and kind of beat myself up and like, I'm so different. Why can't I get my shit together? Like, yeah. Right. And it was like, it was so hard. And for this one friend to acknowledge the fact that this has to be tough. Yeah. And it's and it, in your body. Well, and I think being by yourself too, it just elevates that by saying to yourself, well, like you have nobody to talk to when you're eating or you, you don't feel like making something because you want it like you always make something to share between the two of you really? so it's it's hard it's really hard to to be in that position yeah and it's it's hard to um it's hard to just start to navigate it by yourself right and it takes a while to get your feedback i i bet you, for me i called it the zombie zone i was i was a zombie for about 18 months and, and I have, I've done lots of personal development work. I've done lots, I've got lots of tools. My toolkit's full. And so when somebody tells me that, you know, they're two years or two and a half years out and they're still getting their feet under them, I'm like, I get it. Cause it's not easy. Like when widows tell me like, you know, widows, we, we lots of Facebook groups and stuff are for widows. There's lots of groups out there. And they always say, what's worse, the first year or the second year? And I said, depends. So for me, the first year I was numb and I kind of equate it to like the dental surgery. So it was like my face was frozen and they did all this dental work. And the second year was harder for me because the freezing came out and I was able to see where we hadn't gone yet and that I still wanted to take him. I saw where he was supposed to be in my life and he wasn't. And just I missed him more and more because I wasn't numb anymore. And so my second year was way harder than my first to be real honest with you. And people were like, you know, we have this timeline of grief that you should be over it by now. 
Yeah. And I think the third and fourth year is probably, it's not, not necessarily harder, but it's different. It's it a is. different hard because now you're trying to find your way. You're trying to find yourself. You're trying to find how you want your day to look like without that, per like to be You're trying to do find a to way find to live something. here with grief still in it. Yeah. Right? Like, so grief the first year feels like it's ginormous and it's heavy and you don't know how to carry it and you feel like you're falling down all the time. And as time passes, it the grief doesn't, it's still there. It maybe gets a little bit smaller or you get a bit stronger in handling it um, or you've got more courage to handle it. I don't love telling grievers that they're stronger or that they're strong. I love telling them that they've got courage and that they're brave for getting up every day. Because I can tell you so many people told me I was strong and I did not feel strong. No. I felt like I had to be very courageous and I had to be very brave, um, whether I ch wanted to be or not. Um, yeah. But I had to find ways to allow my grief to be a part of my life and, and be able to have ways where I could hold it. And, and I always tell people like, you know, you have those big moments in your life, like when you graduate high school or college or university, or when you get married or when you have your children, those are like flag point moments in your life that you remember the before and the after, right? You remember what your life was before, like before that, that happened and after. Yeah. And when you lose somebody that you care about, it's the same. And as your life moves away from that flag point, you know, you start to get your feet back under you. Oftentimes, many people do. Some people really don't. They do struggle. Yeah. And neither one of them is a failure. Because grief is as individual as our fingerprints, and none of us do it the wrong way. Right? And the hard part in our society is that we judge grief. We judge how somebody does it. I, why aren't they crying? Why do they cry so much? How come they're not over it by now? And what, I believe- They're out in public already? Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh, they're dating already? Um, why did, they're still wearing their wedding ring? Right? Look at, at the, them, they didn't even dress up. They look like a slob. All of that, right? And I believe that judgment is grief's kryptonite. I believe that when we judge ourselves in, in our grief and when we judge others who are grieving, it stops connection. When we can just say, hey, I see you today, right now, good, bad, and ugly, Yeah, it's, it is it is the way we can hold space. So when we can say, hey, I, you know, because oftentimes we, grievers hear this, please don't cry, you'll make me cry too. Yes, that's it, common. It's super common. And what I choose to say is, Thank you for sharing your tears with me. I'm honored that to hold that sacred space with you because I believe tears are the language of our heart. And when somebody's willing to share that with me, it's a blessing. It means that they trust me. And I don't, I don't want to belittle it. I don't want to put that, tell them to stop because it makes me emotional. Yeah. Um, it's like when people say at Christmas, Merry Christmas, and they're going through the cash register. Merry Christmas. And that's super nice to say. But when you're grieving, I just feel like standing there and say, there's nothing merry about this. <laughs> you know, that's what I feel like saying. And you know what I say to people is, I, I wish you peace this holiday season. Yeah. I, I, I you know. Or I, I wish I would, you love this holiday yeah. season or something. You know, I, I teach a master class, a free master class, um, how to how to invite somebody and their grief to the holiday table. Because lots of times at Christmas time, the people that are grieving don't get invitations. No, they don't and, want a Nancy downer. Yeah. And, and I, I talk about ways of like, Hey, the person may cancel. And instead of being like, Oh my gosh, they canceled. Be like, Hey, you know what? I'd love to bring you leftovers tomorrow. Cause I know today's hard. Yeah. You know, I'd love to, how, how can we find a way to honor your person while we're doing dinner? Can we have a photo with a candle lit? Can we maybe do a memory stocking? Like I give people hands-on tools to be able to honor the person and their grief and have that uncomfortable conversation before the dinner yeah. to say, hey, what is it that you need and how can we best support you? Because it's hard going to Christmas and somebody saying, as they see that you've got tears in your eyes, do you need a, do you need a minute by yourself? And that's the furthest thing from what you need. 
you need people to be around you and you need people to be okay with the fact that it's not easy right now. Yeah. But people don't want to go down that negative stuff. Well, I think they do. It's a matter of they don't, they don't know how to. So that's why they yeah. avoid. And I, I tell people grief is everywhere. You <laughs> a three-year-old who loses their balloon, they grieve. And do you look at that child and go, well, get over it. It's just a balloon. It's gone now. You can't see it. So it shouldn't hurt. We don't say that to a three-year-old. We say, hey, you know, I see you're sad. I'm sad about my balloon. Right? And and we acknowledge their feelings. We see grief with teenagers when you turn off the Wi-Fi. That grief looks a little different than the toddler. Angry. <laughs> Right? They grieve and, and we move through those emotions. And, and when I tell people, you know, you see grief every day. And when you start to acknowledge people's emotions around it and see that those emotions are there and honor them, you're working your grief muscle, which means that when you're dealing with somebody who's in deep grief because they've lost their person, you're, you've got some skills already. You just have to transfer them. And, and it's about finding the right words. And the words do matter. And so learning what they are, learning, you know, any sentence that starts with at least, at least you, at least they weren't suffering. You know, we say that yeah. to that are, you know, people that die of illness, but the person right in front of you is suffering. And so you're minimizing them. So don't say it. At least you can get another dog. It's just as inappropriate to say that as at least you can have another child. Yeah. And people say those to, to people. So don't. Any sentence that starts with at least you're minimizing the person right in front of you. Right? Yeah. Those are good ones. They, 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 and people don't realize that they sting. People think, well, I, I'm sure that made them feel better. They probably didn't. No. And I think the difference between how are you today and versus how's how's your day today, I think what it's doing in our heads when you're grieving is when they say, how are you? You all of a sudden think, you, ooh, I don't feel good. Yeah. Right? So then it just, re it makes it triggered. Versus how's your day? You're not putting the emphasis on you. You're putting yeah. it on your day. And your day could be, you know, on a dial, could yeah. be anywhere from low, medium, or high. Yeah, exactly. So that's what I think is in our head. Yeah. And, and I think that when we are able just to be with somebody exactly where they're at, without judgment, without criticism, just see that they're hurting, it makes such a huge difference. You know, in our society, we often say, I'm sorry for your loss. Yes. Which is a statement that never makes sense to me. When you think about a six-year-old, when they hear that statement, when we're talking about grief, that sentence doesn't make sense to a six-year-old because... When you say, I'm sorry, it's because you've done something wrong. And I'm sorry for your loss. What I choose to say is losing a sibling is a significant loss. And I see you're hurting. And I want you to know my heart goes out to you. And tonight when I'm home, I'll light a candle in your sister's honor. Acknowledges their pain. Acknowledges that I'm willing to do something. Acknowledges so much more than I'm sorry for your loss. Yeah. Right? Um, it makes such a big difference. And I find uh, earlier I spoke about the fact that words matter. And when you're talking to somebody who's grieving, use their words. So if they say their person died, use died. If they say passed away, say passed away. If they say lost, say lost. You know, I was chatting with a gentleman probably about eight months after my husband died. And I said, I understand you just lost your brother. And he's like, I didn't lose him. He died. Oh because I didn't use his word. And his response, most grievers or most supporters would probably take a hiatus. Oh, you're yeah. angry. I don't want to deal with that. Yeah. And that's when you're meant to lean in. Hey, you know what? I'm sorry. That was the wrong word. He did die. And I just wanted to let you know that I, I didn't want it to go unnoticed. Right? And a lot of grievers, you have to know that anger is a part of grief. And that it could be that you have no idea. Like when it comes to grief, they're dealing with all their emotions. They could be dealing with physical pain. 
Um, work has changed. All the people around them have changed. They have changed. And then all of the paperwork and all of the other stuff and the family matters and all of that stuff is added on top of their life. And so lots of times their responses can be quite curt and quite blunt because they get tired of it. And so all of a sudden it's like you can run away or you can actually lean in and say, hey, I want to do something different here. I'm sorry that I used the wrong word and support the person. Yeah. It, it can make such a big difference. I think you see who your friends are real quick. You do. You see your friends that have the skills. I'm not going to say that my other friends that didn't know what to say aren't my friends. I am going to say they didn't have the skills to be my friend in that moment. But I also see the friends that really aren't friends that just don't say anything and then fly the coop. Mm -hmm. I'm but not sure what kind of friend that is. But The hard part is, is they know that the words matter and they say nothing, but they don't realize that the, the silence is deafening. They don't realize that them not saying anything is hurting their person. And yeah. I, there was, when Mike and I were, when Mike was still alive, there was two other couples that we hung out with. I never heard from them again after his funeral. And like the six of us were best friends. Like wow. they, they didn't, they couldn't process his death. So seeing me was difficult, right? Cause I was a reminder that he was gone. And it killed me. That grief was hard for me to process because yeah. they were still alive. Yeah. And I was like, why aren't you showing up? But it took me a long time to go. They couldn't show up. They didn't know how to show up. Right? And those are the moments when people tell me that they, I was strong. And I'm like, I'm broken. Not strong. I'm not strong. <laughs> it takes so a lot of courage to show up. So getting through all of this, you know, from the time that your husband passes away and you're having to put the celebration of life together and then you're digging deep into his stuff, because let's face it, your stuff is up in your head and his stuff is up in his head. And I'll talk to people on the street and I'll say, do you have a backup plan? And it's a woman and a baby buggy. And she goes, yeah, my husband looks after all that. I hate to tell you. <laughs> but it's far from the truth. Yeah. And if you're not doing it, it's purely not going to get done. Or if you're if, not involved in it. If you're not in a communicating of the whole thing, it's not getting done. So somebody has to start the plan. And that's why I created the app to have it easy. And it, it makes you go through each section. And it's, it's like you don't even need a brain because it just you just follow through it. But I just find it funny how you think you have everything under control and have a plan like I sold life insurance for years and years, over 20 years. And I'd say to people, it was the hardest, if you want to call it a sales job. I never considered it selling anything. But when you made a plan to meet and they would post a plan, they would put it off, put it off. It was like a common thing. I'll put it off. Like there's going to be this perfect time to do it. And I know you have something to say about that. I do. So my husband and I were in the process of getting insurance quotes. Now, he is 24 years my senior. So insurance is a lot more expensive when you're that much older, right? And so we'd gotten the three quotes. He had uh, worked for Calgary Fire Department for 30 years. So he had insurance, but he really didn't know what he had. And so the beginning of December, he died December 27th. Um, the beginning of December, I went and changed one of my life insurance policies because I've had life insurance for years, but I was like, I need to change this one. Um, it's not what I need anymore. And so I said to him, hey, I'm going to go change this policy. I think this is the policy we're going to probably go with for you. Do you want to go with me? And he's like, no, I, I do think I want to see what I have. So I'll go to the union hall between Christmas and New Year's and talk to the guys and get that information and then we can make a decision in the new year. 
He died December 27th before he went to the Union Hall. Now, the circumstances of his death, I probably never would have received a payout anyway um, if the life insurance was there. But the reality is, is that we were so close yeah. to getting it all done and the affairs in order and and things kind of all done and not having it done made it so much harder for me. So not having um, things in place to, to cover things off. I was grateful I had his password list so that I could get into stuff because that would have been brutal. But it's a to, mess. It's a it's, mess. Yeah. And, and because at that time we were common law, um, it made it difficult. There, there had to be proof of living together for two years. There, it, was, it was brutal. And if I could do it all over again, uh, it would look very different. And even for my own planning, like afterwards, I was like, okay, hey, we're putting this in place for me just in case something happens to me and my family yeah. can do something because they wouldn't be able to right now. Yeah. And um, it's amazing how we don't, we learn about trigonometry and we learn about weird equations in school, but we don't learn about what you need to do when you die. Yes. And, you know, we don't learn about getting our affairs in order and making sure that what's left behind is, is what is needed for our family members that have to deal with it. Um, and it's even more messier than it ever used to be. Yeah. Like you know, it is. Like I talk about the Waltons show. We all watched Waltons. Yeah. And they would have like this brown paper and they would put all their important documents in it and they'd roll it up tight in a round ball cylinder. And they'd say, this is where all my important documents are. And they'd shove it up in the rafters. At least they had some sort of plan and everybody knew what it looked like. But now we don't even know. Like, I go to clients' houses and say, you know, where's your policies? And some will be in the drawer and some will be in the filing cabinet and some are in the closet. And there's stuff is everywhere. And just think if there's a wildfire or insurance that you need afterwards, like you're, you're screwed. <laughs> you're literally screwed. And I think when I ask clients about getting their insurance, like you would have your husband, I, I heard that a lot and they would postpone it. Well, let me check on my one at work or whatever it might be. But I'd say, well, why don't you put something together because it takes time to have it processed anyways. And then it will be there just in case something did happen. And then we can revise it later when the policy gets approved. Yeah. Yeah. But everybody always takes that as you're trying to sell them something. And for some reason, we think you're trying to sell, you're trying to push it on me and you're trying to make me feel guilty to do it. But you're not. You're just saying, hey, this is what happens sometimes. So you could do it this way. It literally does. It, it, yeah, yeah, and and it, and when all of a sudden it does, and I can tell you, I spent weeks and weeks and weeks trying to process why we didn't make that decision, yeah, why we waited, right? And yeah. it's heartbreaking when you have to put together a GoFundMe account to pay for your husband's funeral, yeah, because you don't have. The resources well no it's so expensive to put all that stuff together people don't realize yeah and the decisions that you have to make for that person that you may not really know like did you think you knew what he wanted i did know him and i had 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 that conversation i knew what he wanted um some of it i couldn't afford he did not want to be cremated i couldn't afford that yeah I, and I, I, I kid you not, I was buying lottery tickets saying to him, if you don't want to be cremated, make sure these are the winning numbers because that's Help another, me out here. <laughs> that's another $8,000. And in my head, I couldn't justify it. And, and I, I just, it broke my heart. Yeah. You know, they're hard decisions that you have to make that 
people, you know, like I'll say to people, when you're sitting around the table and everybody's all happy and normal, that I'd say, well, do you think you could, would you keep your husband's stuff after something happened or would you get rid of it right away? Or would you keep the bedroom the same if your child died? And they'll say, oh, you know, they all have these ideals of situations. But in fact, when it actually happens, no I don't think we know what we want to do. No, you you don't. told me some examples of keeping stuff. What did I keep? You you had a friend who had... Oh, yeah, the, the story. So, so I sold my house two years ago. Um, and I put all my stuff in storage. And then last year, I met a woman who... Her husband died 15 years ago. And she couldn't handle his stuff, so she put it all in storage. And she's been paying $400 a month for storage for 15 years. And I was like, that's a lot of therapy and a lot of good vacations. And I sold everything I owned this fall because I was like, I was only paying $125 a month, but I could see how easy it would be to, to just keep, keep paying that because there's so much, so many memories and so much pain in opening those bins and boxes up. Yeah. And I mean, I still have some things I like personal yeah, and stuff. Yeah. Like, but I don't have a 10 by 10 unit anymore. And I just, I had to have the courage to open up those bins and see those things and let go of things that I was holding on to because, yeah, you know, like, I mean, I told you about it's the hard decisions. Yeah. There's certain things that I was like, I'm not ready to let that go. Like, and, and the gauge for me is if I start to taste a little bit of vomit in the mouth, it means I got to keep it. I'm not ready to let it go. Yeah. You know, and that's that was my gauge. Honestly, it was the weirdest gauge ever, but it worked. Yeah, I was like, no, that. And oddly enough, like I always had three bins of my husband's stuff after he passed. I I kept clothes and cologne and things like that. And every time I opened those bins, I downsized. There's less and less that I need to keep. Yes, as time has passed on, and I'm okay with that. Um, but to give so, yourself grace in in the moment, as well as I'm not ready yet. I'll look at it again in a few months, you know, yeah. like just take it week by week. Yeah. And and it was interesting. The last time I opened those bins up, I, my mom was with me and she's like, do you really need to keep his deodorant? And I said, today I do. And I don't know that I'll, I mean, does it work? It's four years old. No, probably not. But I can open it and it smells like him. Yeah. You know, I have a friend who her husband used um, hair wax. And it was a new bottle. And so it had, it, it, he had only used it once. And nobody understands why she keeps the hair wax. Well, it's because it shows his fingerprint. And it's just like, she's like, I'm, that's, that's a piece of him and it's important to me. And I'm like, and we, Thank you. we talk about that in the last module of your backup plan is the treasure box. Mm -hmm. And it's all the feelings, all your smell your sight yeah and the the feel of it the sound like sound. i'm so grateful like my husband and i used an app called marco polo where instead of texting we would send video chats and we could just watch them whenever and i have these videos so i have videos of him laughing and oh. I have videos of him telling me he loves me and you know i'm so grateful for that because yeah you miss their voice you miss seeing them smile and laugh yeah. And the world of technology can make that easier. And those are little things that you can start to do in your everyday life to be able to yeah. say, you know what? I'm going to record a video to my spouse or my person or my child. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you have no idea what it could mean when all of a sudden you pass unexpectedly or even expectedly. Absolutely. Right. And, and it's just those little tiny things. Mm -hmm. And it's things like learning, you know, like the world of social media. What does it mean to memorialize a, a Facebook page? What are you going to keep? What are you going to lose Yeah. or lose access to? You know, had I known some things, I would have done things differently. Yeah. I'm going to take a quick second and yeah. tell everybody that your information is down below in the description box. And please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. 
and make sure you share it with others because this will be such a great video for people who are struggling. I really think that this can't be <laughs> shoved in their face enough because there are so many people out there walking the streets that are struggling today. And if you can do just anything for them is to share a video like this with them because they'll get they'll get something out of it that's going to help them. And Heidi has some, some great <laughs> tips for us. What was it like dealing with just the little minor things after someone passes? Um, like you said, your cell phone, like some of the things are absolutely ridiculous. Like why do we not have in our world today a proper system for when someone passes away? We're just, we're, we're not prepared. Yeah. His cell phone was hard. I'd kept his cell phone on um, for about three months. I, I waited until like there was no more calls coming in that people hadn't heard. And um, so I phoned the company to, to cancel. And they said, well, we need to speak with Mr. Wilson. And I'm like, well, he's passed away. Yeah, but we need to talk to him to cancel his phone. You're not listed. And what do you not get out of that? I'm like, like, but, he's, like but he's dead. Like 14 times I had to say that he was dead. And they still said, we cannot process this request. We need to speak with him. And I finally said, call heaven. And if you talk to him, let him know I have some things to say to him. As well. So yeah, I was like, I'd like to speak with him. Right? Like, I, I mean, I was pretty angry at that point, right? Because um, it's like, you've left me with quite the mess, mister. Like, and... um and so I actually had to go into the store with his death certificate and a bill that it had past due amount. Cause I was like, I'll wait till it's past due now. I'll just be that person. And I went in and I was like, look, here's a past due amount of $250. If you would like this money, you need to cancel the bill or the, the phone because he's dead. If you don't want his, if you can't do that, then it'll just go to collections. You'll never get the money because He's dead. <laughs> and that's how you'll, that's how I'll get this canceled. Your choice. Companies don't have policies around this because they're just not trained. Well, they're not trained, but the hard part is, is that, you know, abusive relationships, this is how people mess with people's lives. And so there has to be a way to be able to say, here's a death certificate. Here's this. Or when they set up a phone, who is your person? What, like what information can they do so that they could cancel it with a bit of grace? Yeah. Because right now there's no grace. And I know vehicles are difficult too sometimes. Like when it's just in one name, it's very complicated as well. Yeah, it's it's complicated. Everything depends on the province and how they handle it. Um, nobody can give you a straight answer. Like you feel like you're chasing your tail, dealing with the government. Yeah. It's Thanks. brutal. Like, because we were common law, I had to prove that we lived together for two years. But because our licenses had expired the last year, we didn't have, they weren't dated within the two years. Um, it was it was brutal how I was handled and how I was treated. Some workers were fabulous. You'd phone and they were compassionate and caring. And some of them were just despicable. And And I had to remind them that I'm like, you realize that he just died three months ago, right? And they're like, well, you guys weren't together that long. Shouldn't be that bad. And I was like, well, maybe I'm grieving the fact that I deserve to have longer, that I still had a lot to do with him. Like, time doesn't matter of how long somebody's been with them. It doesn't yeah. matter. No. You know. And I that's why grief groups, like, when I did grief counseling, I didn't go into a grief for widows. I went into a grief for young widows because, you know, it's different grief when somebody's been with somebody for 50 years compared to somebody who's under the age of 40 and lost unexpectedly. And all of us are going, there was still so much to do. Yeah. This doesn't make sense. No. Right. And it's that darn why. You know, I had to stop asking myself why, because it's kept me here Yeah. and not here. Why is this hurt so much? Why is this so hard? There's Why no did answers. It yeah, there's no answers to those questions. No. 
And it really stopped me from feeling. And when I stopped asking myself the why and just saying this hurts or I'm angry or I'm sad or I just miss him, it allowed me to move through the emotions. And sometimes it was graceful, Tina, and sometimes it was not so graceful. Yeah. Sometimes there was a lot of Kleenex. The best grief gift I ever got was from my neighbor from across the street. He showed up with the Costco size pack of Kleenex with really good Kleenex. Ah. Like that was like him and I have a great relationship. We, we joke and kid around and he knew I wouldn't be offended, right? Like some people might be offended. I think it's funny. I thought it was perfect. Like it made yeah. us laugh. It was very useful. I'm going to tell you. We, yeah. It was needed. Um, and not just by me, but others in the home that came to spend time with me. Um, it was perfect. It Like you can think outside the box and, and do things differently. Um, Literally. Ha ha. Uh-huh. Totally, right? <laughs> I mean, I had another neighbor who showed up like two hours after he died with a bottle of rum oh. and a plastic plant that said, live, laugh, and love. Oh. I threw that plastic plant across the room. I was so angry because guess what? I was not living. I was not loving and I was not laughing two hours after time of death. No. Oh. I just but wasn't. But, but her intent they, was the her intent, intent was, was nice. Yeah. But in that moment, it was so inappropriate. And people don't think about that. Like, I, I guarantee you, she went home and heard about it because she loves both of us. And she was like, I got to do something. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, alcohol is probably not the best gift to give somebody because it's a depressant. Um, and, and she did it because she knows I love rum. I'm not going to lie. I'm a bit of a pirate that way. But um, in the moment, it's not a great idea. Yeah, in that moment. Um, and then, you know, just to be okay with the, the fact that, hey, you know what, you're hurting. You know, one of the other greatest things that somebody did for me was there's a website called mealtrain.com. And they set me up a profile and created a link so that instead of me getting 17 lasagnas, people would sign up for a day and they'd put in what they were going to bring or what, what meal they were making so that I'd end up with different food throughout the week. Cause I mean, I'm German and lots of people in North American culture, we show up, I call it the casserole brigade. Yeah. We'll show up with our grandma's vintage Pyrex with some sort of concoction that they're supposed to eat, even though they're not eating. Um, and so, I mean, I had a friend of mine when her husband passed unexpectedly, he died in a, in, a, in the ocean actually unexpectedly. Um, she had 17, um, oh, I always forget the name, um, mashed potatoes, peas, meat, um, ground oh, beef. shepherd's pie. Thank you. Because she had little kids. And she had when when she finally emptied out her freezer, she still had 17 left. Oh, my. So I can't even imagine, right? So um, that's a lot of shepherd's pie. And people would show up, and they would bring these massive amounts of food. And I was like, I'm grateful that one, I had a good relationship with the fire hall because my husband was a fireman and they lived across the street because there was times that I just took the food there because I was like, this is too daunting for me to even start. Like, yeah. Right. So um, that's a really good, great resource. And the nice part is, is it's a link. So all of a sudden you can send that link to your church group. You can send it to your work people. You can send it to your neighbors and, and the different groups that all want to be there to support you. Um, but they don't all communicate. And so all of a sudden it's like, hey, there's 12 spots where you can sign up and bring food. And then after that, you know, maybe send a skip the dishes card. And yeah, for my friends. I think someone could help you set that up too or do that for yeah, you. Yeah, so somebody did that. They were just like, Heidi, do you have any food intolerances? Yeah. How many people, how many, how often do you want food delivered? And actually I had a friend who she just, she actually showed up at my door the next day for my birthday. She was afraid I was by myself. And I, I wasn't because the next day was my birthday and my husband was planning a 40 person surprise birthday party for me, mm. at which we'd canceled. But my family and stuff and some of the people that were coming from out of town were still there. And we literally, she showed up with this massive thing and then she just saw that I was so different than who I am. She said, you were there, but you weren't. And so she just took control of the meal train and she's like, people just brought her the food and she would had a key to the house and she'd just come and bring it in. She goes, you don't need people seeing you like this right now. Yeah. She goes, nice. some, yeah. Like she just showed up and, and she lived like a 45 minute drive from me, but she showed up 
for, for if you're supporting somebody who you don't live in the same city or the same town or the same country, you can mail a grief book. You can do a Zoom. You can send a skip the dishes card. You can send even a gas card. Because let me tell you, when somebody dies, your work level goes down and your co incre costs increase. And you have lots of unexpected co costs. And so you can show up in ways, even if you're not in the same city, um, it does make a difference. And well, I do like, I really, costs having to deal with it too. Uh -huh. Drive here, drive there, go do this, do that, that you wouldn't normally have to do. Yeah, exactly. And so I always just tell people like, Grief is messy. It's not easy. We've never been we've never been taught how to deal with it. And when you step in and you make a mistake and you say the wrong thing, just own up to it. Be like, dang, this is hard and it's sticky and that didn't come out right. Yeah. And I didn't mean to hurt you. And if you're a griever and somebody said something that didn't land right, say something to them. Say, hey, that probably wasn't the right thing to say. Don't go home and muddle in your muck and then not have your friend anymore. Turn around and say this is this this is probably not the best thing to say and this is why or it just didn't feel right let's not talk about that again yeah so that you you don't lose your friend because of something that they said without understanding that it it hurt you yeah because there's enough family drama oh, that yeah. you don't need any of the other stuff on top of that yeah exactly um i know we're gonna do lots more together heidi um absolutely and gosh where's the time gone what i know I, I, that's why i kind of was like i better stick that in there before that's, we. that's crazy we have so it, much it's say. the grief vortex tina <laughs> it just takes you in it just envelopes you yeah um what final message would you like to give the listeners you know what the grief is love and that it is meant to be done with connection and that we need to have grace with grief so that we can grieve with grace together. That's lovely. They always say the pain of grief is as much as you loved somebody. Yeah. Shows you how much love there was. So yeah. nobody can tell you that you shouldn't be grieving yeah. or you should be over it by now. My, my counselor said to me the first time, she said, when I witness deep grief, it's because I'm witnessing deep love. And That's it's right. true. Yeah. And so when you see somebody hurting deeply, we don't get to judge how they feel. We don't get to say, oh, well, that was your ex-husband or your ex-wife. It hurts them right now. It doesn't matter if, if they're 10 years down. You know, this anniversary, this, my husband, I call it his wing anniversary. Um, it's the day he gained his wings on the 27th. And it was a hard one for me because it meant that he was in my life. He's been gone longer than he was in my life. And until I said that to somebody, they didn't really realize how significant it was. You know, and I have another friend who, it her husband died 12 years ago. And her birthday was a hard one because she turned the age that he was when he died. Oh. And so... All these little tiny triggers. Exactly. And so we don't get to decide when grief hits. And it is like the ocean. It hits us in different paces and places and... We just have to just hold space and honor people and, and, and let them be where they're at and and be okay with the fact that it doesn't need to look pretty right now, that they can be messy and sad and, and that's okay and we can sit with them. It's uncomfortable for us, yeah. but the reality is, is the people that sat with me when I was messy crying are people that I treasure today. Absolutely. You sure find out who your friends are, so to speak. Um, cause family doesn't even step up to the plate sometimes. So, yeah. Well, and sometimes, I mean, on the U S side, like you look at it, if I, if I was in the U S, um, common law, I, I know people that were common law for 30 years and the spouse dies and the house goes to the family, the, pa the parents and the siblings and not to the, to the wife. Yeah can't even imagine like you lose everything the level of poverty in the u.s for widows is astronomical yeah and our whole 2500 dollars death benefit we get in canada make sure you don't spend that all in one place we get more than they do in the u.s that's what i mean like yeah. even that little tiny bit <laughs> yeah not a lot it doesn't go far when you have all those expenses yeah, a, a simple funeral is, is pricey. Yeah, yeah. 
And it's a cost that you don't really want to do either. Uh -huh. You know, you don't want the cost on top of the pain. It's like double doozy. Well, and, and on top of that, that celebration of life for that funeral is a really important step in terms of you want to honor your person uh -huh. and you want to do it in a certain way. And we all know that the funeral industry can, can be, not all places, can be a bit feeling like you've been fed to the sharks. Yeah. And so knowing what that, that looks like and what what's important to you and getting back to the basics is, is really important because it can, it can add up fast. I always suggest to go to these places with somebody that isn't emotionally tied to the situation to hold your hand because it kind of helps give you some support. Well, and having an idea ahead of time of what, the person wants. I knew. Yeah. Well, wanted, yeah. I knew if my they husband. Do your wanted backup a plan app. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You would know. <laughs> I knew my husband wanted a traditional firefighter wedding or wedding. That he wanted that too, but yeah. uh, he wanted a traditional funeral. I and mean, I talked about that. He was like, "I want to be honored with my brothers." Right. Right. But if I didn't know that, I it would have looked very differently if I, if I hadn't known that wish. Right. Even just that little tiny bit of the story. Yeah. Right. Having the conversations is actually, it can help with your grief. Yeah. No, me not knowing would have left me guessing and wondering if I did him, did right by him. Right. Forever and, so, and ever and ever. Yeah. And so having the conversations about organ donation um, and understanding what organ donation looks like and what it, what it entails and making sure you're prepared for it. Cause I definitely wasn't. Um, and then knowing what, what their wishes are means that you don't have to guess. Yeah. And you don't have to stick in your head of, did I do right by them? Yeah, forever in your mind. Mm -hmm. That will haunt you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Heidi. That was awesome. I'm yes, so I grateful know. for you coming on our show today. So please like, share, and subscribe to our show if you already haven't. I'm happy to have you come on our show. Absolutely. We love to have you here. Um, we are not Superman. But we act like we are because nothing's going to happen, right? Nothing's going to happen, right, Heidi? Nothing. Nothing will happen. Yeah, right. Yeah. But as you know, that's far from the truth. And we look at the last five years in the world around us and the shootings in the schools and the streets and the work accidents and the car accidents and the overdoses. Look at the earthquake that's happened this week the crazy wars and the floods and the hurricanes and the tornadoes around us. We are not prepared. We are the city, the town, the country, the state, the province. They're not even prepared. So we need to be prepared. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe and hit that subscribe button if you already haven't. We'd love to have you on our channel if you're thinking of that special someone right now watching the show that you haven't spoken to in a while, you haven't talked to in a while, please reach out to them. Call them. We still have phones. Zoom them. FaceTime them. Knock on their door. Let them know how much you love and care about them because you don't know what tomorrow might bring. And we always end our show with Carol Burnett. I know Heidi knows who Carol Burnett is. I'm so glad we had this time together just to have a laugh or sing a song. Seems we just get... I just <laughs> lost my saliva there for a second. We just get started and before you know it comes a time we have to say so long. So long, everybody. I'm so happy to have you on our show um, expect the unexpected and be kind and stay safe till next time. Thank you, Heidi, for coming on. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Till next time. Love to have you. Bye.